couple of days back, the FDA approved a new drug known as teplizumab. This drug would delay the onset of stage 3 type 1 diabetes by 2 years. It's a 14 days injectable course and the cost of the drug only is a whopping $200,000. Can you imagine? And I am going to talk about, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. And what I'm going to talk about, what is the true cost of illness and health? Now, let me introduce you to some terms. When we talk about cost, it is meaningless. Cost should always be talked about in terms of what is called as cost-benefit analysis, cost-effectiveness analysis, and cost-utility analysis, and I'll talk about it a bit later. And this is usually expressed in monetary terms because that is only one thing we know, money, money, and money. Cost of illness and burden of disease is another aspect and that encompasses various aspects of the disease on health outcomes in a country, specific regions, communities, and even individuals. The category of cost of illness can range from the incidence of prevalence of disease, its effect on longevity and morbidity along with decrease in health status and quality of life, financial aspects including direct, indirect expenditures that result from premature death, disability or injury due to the disease or its comorbidities. Now the whole purpose of a cost analysis, I will call it cost analysis, is to formulate and prioritize healthcare policies and interventions and to achieve policy efficiency. Now that is the basic criteria. Now this subject is known as pharmacoeconomics. And when we talk about pharmacoeconomics, I talked about cost-benefit analysis that basically is both cost and benefits of a new drug or of a health intervention are converted into monetary terms. Although it's very, very difficult to attach monetary value to healthcare. Cost-effective analysis, when two or more alternative strategies are compared by measuring the cost and outcomes of each, they can be assessed as natural units like life year gained, reduced mortality, morbidity, blood pressure, etc. Cost utility analysis, the intervention outcomes are measured in, in terms of utility or preferences like disability adjusted life years or quality adjusted life years. Now, the, the daily can be seen as one of the lost year of healthy life. Daily adjusted is one year of healthy life is lost. And computed as the sum of years lost due to disability for people living in ill condition, in ill health condition, and the years of loss, life lost due to premature mortality. The quality of adjusted life years is measured on a scale from zero representing death to one representing one year of perfect health and it is routinely used to measure the outcome of health evaluations for all kind of uh, uh, individuals and for all kinds of drug or diseases. So this is basically, you know, once these two you have, then you look at the incremental cost effective ratio and this is further going into details. Now look at the cost of employees uh, health in US a whopping $178 billion for wages and benefits for incidental absences due to illness. $198 billion for diminished productivity. $1.4 billion, $73 billion. Look at the amount of cost that is lost if the employee gets sick. Let's look at the Indian healthcare. In 2013-14, the data that I could get, India's total health care expenditure was 4.5 lakh crores. Unfortunately, we are spending, majority of our spending from our own pocket. And that was 2.9 lakh crores was being spent from their portion. And this is equivalent to 4% of the GDP. Look at what, what the US is doing. In comparison, the government's expenditure on healthcare was just 1.5% of the GDP. The government is, Indian government is not spending much on healthcare. They have realized this after COVID. And now, because our Honorable Prime Minister has become wiser after COVID, he has now increased the GDP. 
Meanwhile, 1.5 lakh crores of Indians' healthcare costs goes towards pharmacy. If you look at US and European, 17.3 and 9.9% of the GDP is, was there in healthcare way back in 2014. So this is, I talked about what is the expenditure. But now coming to the cost of illness, the, the, how do you, what, what, what studies do you use? They evaluate the economic burden that an illness will impose on the society as a whole. Itemize, value, sum the cost of a particular problem with the aim of giving the economic burden. And I'll give you an example of it later. The underlying assumption is that this represents the potential benefits of a healthcare intervention if it can eradicate the illness. And it also measures the burden of years of life lost due to premature death and years lost due to disability or morbidity. And these two categories, as I talked about, disability adjusted life years. Now, there are various formulas they use. One is the, the population attributable fractions, which is production of relative risk, product of relative risk, and prevalence risk factor. And these are, they calculate. Now, let me give you some of the evidence prevalence-based studies that are analysis that are done. What is the cost incurred during year by persons with a particular illness? Estimates the magnitude of disease costs on annual basis. Assesses economic burden attributable to acute or transient conditions. And does not quantify long-term consequences of behavior of illness. That is very important. It is not taking into account behavior. Now, let's look at some of the cost, direct cost. What is the value of resources? personal health care, hospital care, professional services, medications, etc. And there are certain indirect costs. The value of lost output due to mobility, as I talked about the, uh, the employee getting sick, or mortality, the future earnings in a family, young person dies, what is the cost? Look at the huge list of direct health care costs. I'm not going to read it. But there is, this is again as I said, tip of the iceberg. There are direct non-health care costs like social services, counseling, transportation, time, etc. And indirect costs like mobility, impairment, uh, absenteeism. And these are, these are something, you know, you add up, it's enormous. Now let me give you an example of obesity and diabetes because they both go together. Seven out of ten of the countries with the greatest number of diabetics are in the global south. We all know. And this is going to increase. I'm not going to go on that and greater incidence at earlier stages of life, as has already been discussed. Nearly one out of every three hospital bed days uh, is occupied for diabetes-related causes. Imagine, in India, 15 to 25 percent of the household income is required to cover treatment cost. I won't go into Tanzania, China, they have got others, but I'll talk about India. But look at the cost, total cost of obest economic. Patient will have diabetes, $11.5 billion. Gallbladder disease, 2.4. Cardiovascular, $22 billion. Hypertension, cancer. So the cost keeps on adding up. Total cost comes to around $40, million, $40 billion. You revise the estimate because the patient is going to develop musculoskeletal problems. And it jumps to 45 or almost $46 billion. You add the indirect cost. Lost productivity, 20 billion in US, 23 billion updated study. And then level of sickness, absence. Then 7% of total productivity lost due to obesity. 27% of the growth in real capital spending between 87 to 2001. And this is prevalence of obesity is increasing. So the cost is recurring and is increasing. You can imagine the enormous cost spent in the treatment of obesity and diabetes. Now look at pain, another very common thing. It, it, can, it has a lot of problems, sleep disturbances, depression, anxiety, co decreased quality, disrupted routine life, reduced social activity, disability, absenteeism, etc. And if you look at the productivity, almost 12 hours are lost due to pain in 15 days. So what work the patient will do? And that is not counted. Look at the critical illnesses in our country. Cardiovascular, lung, cancer, liver, kidney diseases. And look at the cost. 
Look at the cost, 1 lakh, 50, 3 lakh, 50,000. However, we are still much better off. Because if you compare it with, say, abroad, the cost of a heart bypass surgery is $144,000 in US, but only $5,200 in India. So that way we are much better off. And there are other things also, like the cost of hip replacement, $50,000 in US, $7,000 in India. The question comes, are these cost saving studies really needed? They are either fully or partially preventing a given disease to a large extent is basically illusory. Assuming all the costs attributed to a given disease could be measured accurately and that adequate prevention were introduced, the cost savings from using cost illness calculations are likely to be overestimated because there are very few diseases that can be eradicated. So the total cost of treatment will not be saved. When prevention fails, there are certain capital investments already done, like clinics, they'll continue to treat those patients who still have the disease. So that margin of cost again comes down, cost saving comes down. Although treatment cost may be high, the cost of prevention could be greater at times. So that is also another aspect. And a high cost condition, it is not necessarily amenable to treatment by current medical technology. In contrast, a condition which presents a low cost to society may be fully amenable to prevention with very low cost, leading to high individual health gains. Now let us to look at two examples, phenylketonuria and breast cancer. If you just screen patients for phenylketonuria, the amount of benefit that you're going to get is much better than screening every lady for breast cancer. And this is what the whole thing is about. Prevention is simple and inexpensive and the health gain to the individual is great in patients with phenylketonuria. So these studies may divert decision makers attention away from areas where important health gains can be made at a low cost. So, though they are widely uh, undertaken, the cost of illness studies and add little to the creation of an efficient healthcare system. But it is it, the actually it should be better focused on undertaking economic evaluations such as cost-effective analysis, and this is looking at both the cost and the outcomes. That is more important. Now, let me show you one wonderful study published recently. Cost effectiveness of ampagliflozin in the patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. <coughs> and this, what did this study do? It shows that the cost is $437,000. This is done in US. And the cost of SGLT2 inhibitors is exorbitant there, not like our generics. And they said it is of low economic value. Now try explaining this to a patient who comes to you with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and has come and heard from Eugene Braunwald that this is the only treatment which is a game changer in heart failure with preserved. Will you tell him, no, it is not cost effective? No, you will not tell him. You will like to. No cardiologist will deny a patient of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction the, the benefit of SGLT2 inhibitor. So they are saying that, okay, we are going to look at the study again when the cost of EMPA comes down. Now, see, when people get old, over the age of 50 years, they start getting ill. So this is another very good study which was done. How much money they have saved for their health? 40% said we have enough savings to pay for health care that we might need. 27%, I can't afford health care. 18% did not care about health care. 13% never thought that they will get it. So this is the current situation. So what is the answer, friends? I would like to quote Warren Buffett, the investment guru, who said, the best investment you'll ever make is in yourself. So prevent illness. Exercise daily, sleep well, reduce salt intake, maintain healthy eating habits, and the cost will come down. Thank you.